Good morning, potential investors, and welcome to our presentation on China. We're hoping to give you a lot of information today to help you decide on whether or not you think it's a good business investment. My name is Pamela Scott, and I'm going to be talking to you today about the economy of China, and the rest of the experts here with me are Jacqueline Rojas, who's going to be speaking to you about the uh, culture of China, Dasha Ponte, who is going to be speaking to you about the geography of China, Samantha Tron, who will be speaking about the politics of China, and then Anthony Scott, who will be speaking about the restrictions on doing business with China. So with that said, moving on to myself, the beginning of the presentation. As I said, my name is Pamela Scott. I am an economist. I have a PhD in economy, and I am specialized in the Asian infrastructure. So as far as China's economy goes, I'll be speaking to you about the GDP, as well as the stability, and China's general place in the global economy. So for the GDP, as you can see, China's GDP is slowing down. If you were to go back a little further before this graph, it was actually higher than that. They've had a really huge leap in the last decade or so in their GDP, their gross domestic product, their pur which is their purchasing power. Now this is a, a graph that I picked up from Forbes, and what it shows is that they're slowing down, but as you can see, it's starting to come back up at the end over here in 2012 with a 7.9. So the point of the GDP is to show their purchasing power. China's purchasing power, uh, the reason that it's caused a lot of problem in terms of investment lately is that they are in fact uh, slowing down, but it's actually okay. And the reason that I'm gonna get into that is actually to do with the stability. So on to my next point, they're having structural reforms right now in China, which is the cause of the slowing. A lot of people don't research into it enough. They assume that because the GDP is dropping, then China is now a bad place to invest in. Your investments are going to go down. But in fact, what China is doing is structural reforms. <coughs> According to their prime minister right now, I'm um, sorry, their financial minister right now, they are reinvesting that money into infrastructure, meaning they're investing in their roads, they're investing in their businesses, uh, domestic things. So it's going to actually be better in the long run. It's going to uh, reap benefits from that that will be great for investors, I believe. The infrastructure reforms are showing through the middle class. The middle class is really burgeoning in China, and part of the stability of that is that's exactly what you need for a consumer's culture to bloom. And as long as the middle class is continuously growing, they're going to be able to purchase more. That means that depending on what you're investing in, there is a huge culture in China to buy it. There is a huge population there, and as long as uh, the middle class continues to gain disposable income, they will be able to purchase those goods. So it really depends with China on where you're investing. If you're investing in consumer goods, I would say it's a really great idea. And moving on to my last point, China's place in the global economy. Here's a, this graph is from Forbes as well. And uh, Kenneth Raposa <coughs> was noting that even though there is a slowing growth, you can see here, this is the, the growth of the middle class. This is what I was talking about in terms of stability too. As long as the, the middle class continues to double as it has been doing, that is a lot of purchasing power in the global economy as well. They're now taking in far more products from other countries and not just, um, basic products, but larger things like electronics, laptops, computers, and then they're also traveling as well, which is a, a good sign of an economy that's actually growing into itself. And by 2022, 75% um, of China's middle class should be earning around $60,000, which if you're thinking about that in terms of what that buys in China, that's really a lot of uh, purchasing power. So that said, I did speak to you a bit about the GDP in China as well as the uh, stability of the economy, which I believe is, is really important. And then also China's place in the global economy. I think it's actually uh, much better than it's generally portrayed right now. And I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to Jacqueline, who's going to speak to you. <coughs> 
Good morning, and as Paula mentioned, my name is Jacqueline Rojas, and I have a master's degree in cultural studies from St. Edward's University, and I've been living in China for the past five years. I'm gonna cover China's language, their business etiquette, and places that you should visit, and places that you shouldn't visit, and maybe what times in the year you should or shouldn't visit. So the first thing I'm gonna cover is language, and of course the language spoken in China is Chinese, but Simon Ager does say that there's different, um, I guess, kind of dialects in Chinese. And even though that it is the most spoken language, it shouldn't shy you away from doing business with them because English is something that they do know, and it's actually also taught in their public schools. I personally believe that their form of writing is actually really beautiful. I think it's an art in itself, and it does take a long time to master. So the next thing I'm going to cover is business etiquette. Um, these come from Mary, Bro uh, Mary Borstrock's book, and her book is just about, it just covers the things that you should do and you think you shouldn't do when you're confronted with um, Chinese people and in business. So the first thing is going to be meeting and greeting. It's the first thing you do when you meet someone. And in Chinese culture, it is very traditional to bow when you meet someone, but recently it's become really acceptable and a lot more common to do a handshake, so that would be okay. The next thing will be body language, and so with body language, you should not kick up your feet or lean back or like just put your feet on the chair in front of you when you're in a meeting. <coughs> it's completely disrespectful, and you you would don't you would not want to do that. Another thing would be blowing your nose and then putting the handkerchief back in your pocket. It's actually seen as like a really, really vulgar act and that's another thing you probably shouldn't do. Um, one thing that would be really important is that you probably shouldn't touch these businessmen. And by, what I mean by that is like you can't pat them on the back or just like kind of link elbows or things like that. It's not something they're really comfortable with. They like to keep things really professional, really business. So the next thing would be corporate, corporate culture. And with corporate culture, the most important thing is timing. You can never, ever be late to something because it is just, it's just such a bad image to have. They're so punctual with everything that timing is the most important thing. Also, you should be prepared for long meetings. They might even last, I mean, not 10 days straight through, but you know, their meetings, they keep meeting up and doing changes and adjustments to what they're talking about. Um, there's also times during a meeting where there might be a period of silence and you have to be totally respectful and not say anything or do anything during that time. The next thing would be dining and entertainment. So, when it comes to dining and entertainment, you should expect toast for um, any kind of occasion. And like in our Western culture, you should drink after the toast, no, not any time before. Um, you also should not discuss business during um, dining or anything like that because it's not the time and place for them. And unless they bring it up, you shouldn't bring it up. The next thing I'm gonna talk about is the dress. So for women, you should dress very modestly, very conservative, really professional pantsuits, um, those skirt suits, or some nice dress, but just make sure that it's very modest. For men, you should wear like a sport jacket with a tie or a suit, a nice sh dress shirt. Not white though, because it is seen really as a, it's, like the way David mentioned, it's a funeral ceremony um, reference. And so the last thing would be gifts. Um, when you hand someone a gift, you need to hand it with both hands. You also, again, with the no white, no white bow, no white wrapping, you don't want any of that either. Um, the next thing I'm gonna talk about are places that you should visit and places you should probably stay away from. Um, According to the Huffington Post, these three locations are among the top 10 locations that you should visit when in China. So the first one is the Great Wall of China. Of course, if you're going to China, you should visit the Great Wall of China. It is over 13,000 miles long and is named one of the seven wonders of the world. Um, 
you should avoid it during the winter though because it does get well below zero degrees. The next thing you should visit is the Lishan Giant Buddha. It is over 223 feet tall and it is actually carved right into the cliffs where it's located. Um, you can actually climb onto the Buddha's like feet and climb up it and it's actually really cool and you, as you can imagine the scenery is really beautiful. The next thing that you should visit is this terracotta army. It was discovered only just a few years ago and what they are, um, they're these life-size sculptures of warriors. They were found in the temple of uh, Emperor Shikwandi and he was completely obsessed with um, immortality and had these built for his tomb so they could protect him even after death. So the places you shouldn't visit. Um, if you're in China, you should likely not visit zoos just because we are used to our Western culture and the way that we treat animals, the way we think of animals. But at the same time, um, you should be considered that this is a completely different culture. The way they think about animals and the way they think animals should be treated is completely different. Um, it's similar to the way that we eat meat, we eat beef, burgers, steaks, we love it. And in other cultures, um, the cow is a sacred animal and they would never do something like that. So if you think a bit of it that way, yeah, but it's, it should, this should be avoidable. The other thing is be China during their golden week. This week is when people visit their Chinese relatives from all around the world. They all come and they walk to China and the, it is so full. The traffic is so heavy. It's really hard to find transportation and the tickets to anything are really, really expensive. But if you are willing to go through all of that, um, the festivities that they hold um, seem to be really, really fun. But Again, you do have to deal with the traffic, the overcrowding, and the higher prices of places. So in conclusion, so in conclusion, I talked about um, China's language and how even though Chinese is the main language, it shouldn't shy you away from doing business with them because English is well spoken. Um, the next thing I talked about was their business etiquette, covered some things about what you should do, what you shouldn't do, reasons why. <coughs> And then I also covered the places you should visit and the places you shouldn't visit. So now I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Dasha. Hello, everyone. My name is Dasha Fonte. I have a major in geography, and I have been living in China for the past seven years. So today I'm going to talk about the geography, and I'm going to do that by covering um, its landscape and climate, the population, and the infrastructure. So to begin with, um, China has a wide range of landscapes and climate. Um, Central China consists mainly on smaller mountains, deserts, salt lakes, and grasslands in the south of Mongolia. And Western China, however, on the other hand, um, descends into the low river plains that are the country's fertile heartland. And, um, the weather also varies greatly. It ranges from really hot summers to really um, cold winters. The far north experiences um, cold winters at about 40 degrees Fahrenheit and really hot summers at about 100 degrees Fahrenheit. And um, China receives uh, the same weather uh, during the southern part and it has of tropical um, climate, which is really, really hot, humid summer, and it usually brings typhoons. And although much land has been deforested from the industry, north, northeast China still has large forests, um, while further south uh, has rainforests and really important medical plants. Now I'm going to tell you a little bit about the population. So um, unfortunately, there isn't a really simple answer to the question of how many people live in China. Um, since uh, it is a country of several different parts and not all is governed by Beijing, um, China is the largest country in the world today. And according to the World Population Review, in January 2013, um, 
the Chinese government released data confirming that the population was 1,354,040,000. Um, and this does not include Taiwan, Hong Kong, and Macau. Um, however, by September of this year, um, that number has even grown to about um, 10 million people. Uh, now I'm going to talk to you about the infrastructure. And um, so this development remains a priority for the Chinese government. And according to McKinsey and Company, its modern economy rides um, on reliable roads, rails, and electricity. From the late 1990s to 2005, 100 million Chinese electricity um, people benefited from power and telecommunication upgrades. Between 2001 and 2004, investment in rural roads grew um, massively about 51% annually. And um, China has this equal ambitions for the future, um, aiming to bring the entire nation's urban infrastructure up to middle class infrastructure. And so to conclude today, I talked to you about the geography by telling you about the population, the infrastructure, and the landscape and climate. Now I'm going to hand it over to Sam. As Nasha said, my name is Samantha Tron. Um, I have a degree in politics and have lived in China for the past five years. Today I will be talking about China's politics with the foreign relations, their administrative, um, initiative divisions, and the social political issues and reform. To start off, I'd like to talk about um, a little background of China. So China's first empire was called the Qin Dynasty, and it began in 221 BC. And then its last empire was actually overthrown in 1912, when China became a republic. China is a communist government, which began in 1949. And just to talk a little bit about the um, Communist Party, um, they determine basically most of China's uh, life. They determine what you learn in school, what kind of jobs you have, what kind of housing you have, um, even how many kids you have. So this is a very strict, and China's um, Communist Party has been known to resort to very a lot of uh, brutality when dealing with issues. If someone or a group of people protests against their beliefs, they have known to um, start a lot of brutal confrontations. See. Um, they elect a central committee, which then in turn elects a new pol Politburo. And interestingly enough, 80 to 95% of China's population is actually satisfied with their communist government, which I found was really interesting because they have adapted a different way of living than, say, the United States would, where they have, um, they have, access they have um, accepted the way of living under someone's control. Um, China also has a pyramid structure. As you can see, the Politburo is at the very top and consists of nine members. And then another important part um, is the Military Affairs Commission. They actually, con the Politburo controls this commission and they com control the National People's Congress and the State Council. They have 24 members in total and they work as an inner cabinet to compare to the United States because it is um, consists of the country's most influential leaders. The leaders are mostly actually senior leaders, which I found was interesting because in China, in order to gain that higher position, they have to work at it and earn it. And not just through hard work, but they also have to um, not be involved in any huge confrontations, which I thought was interesting because they don't want to um, create a bad image or bad name for themselves. Then I'll move to my next point of foreign relations. Um, China has relations with 171 countries, and they actually have embassies in 164 of those countries. They um, are one of five permanent members of the United Nations Security Council and are a member of the BRICS group of emerging major economies. They have a motto called Harmony Without Uniformity, which is interesting because this means that they will have um, relations with other countries that they have differing ideological beliefs with. This means that they won't, um, they will conduct business with other countries that they don't have the same beliefs as, which is very important <coughs> because they keep it strictly professional. They don't 
take their beliefs into account when um, dealing with different countries. And then they also have a one China policy. And the one China policy is basically that they don't consider there to be two governments of China. They only consider it to be a one state called China. This means that if other countries want to do business in China, they have to only associate with one of the governments. They can't associate with the Republic of China and the People's Republic of China. They have to pick one or the other and break relations with the second government. And then my third point is the administrative divisions. They have 21 provinces, um, five autonomous regions, and three city regions. These include larger cities um, and districts, as well as counties and urban districts as well. My last point is the socio-political socio issues and reform. So the socio-political issues and reform um, is basically giving political freedom that is tightly restricted. This means that the citizens have fundamental rights, but these rights are very um, limited and they're also most of the time not followed as strictly as, say, the United States would be. They have the freedom of speech, press, religion, um, as well as right to fair trial, universal suffrage, and property rights. But they are also um, one of the top countries that are known for human rights abuses. Interestingly enough, some of these abuses include detention without trial, um, a high rate of use of the penalty, death penalty, um, forced <coughs> confessions, and also torture. So this just kind of shows a little um, insight on how the rights of the Chinese citizens aren't as um, flexible as United States rights. They have these rights put there, but they're not, um, in, they're not followed as well as United States is. And then China actually has made some reform efforts. In 2013, they had made plans to abolish the re-education through labor program. So they're trying to not be as strict with their labor um, and their education forms. Okay, and to conclude today, I talked a little bit about Chinese <coughs> politics with their foreign relations and the one China policy, and then I moved on to their administrative divisions with their different districts, and I concluded with their social political issues and reform, including the um, citizens' rights of the Chinese. I will pass it off to Anthony. Hello, everybody. I'm Anthony Scott. I'm from Chinese Studies Center. Um, I'm here to talk to you about the restrictions of China, including environmental restrictions, the visa policies, and the import and export regulations. Um, let's just get straight into it. Let's start um, the environment. China really took interest in the environment and coming to um, sustainable growth in 2007, they began putting many policies in place to improve and become um, a lot to a better standard where they're not polluting as much as they actually continually do, even now. Um, despite a lot of efforts, including things such as on certain days, um, certain cars aren't allowed to drive, certain areas can't drive, they try to regulate driving policies, they put stuff in for businesses, um, they did many different things. These have all failed because, frankly, no one follows them. Um, the laws are present, but they're unenforced. Basically, what happens is um, the industries continue to receive backing to where they're still allowed to do what they want. Um, the regulations are there, but due to corruption, bribery, and basically the government putting economic growth over the environment, um, these industries continue to receive cheap land rates, um, cheap electricity, they cheap water, um, they get a lot of breaks to where they shouldn't have. Um, according to lifescience.com, they actually said that um, the environmental part of government is increasing by about um, 20 to 30 percent each year. So even with this increase, it's surprising that no actual improvement has been made in this sector. Um, immigration. In an article written by Wei Jing Zhu in the World of Chinese website, it's a news website, um, the green card isn't actually worth the trouble of getting it. Not many immigration officials, people, or basically 
nobody who works in the airport actually knows that a Chinese green card exists, other than those who have one. Um, the general process of what people go through is when they arrive and they show a green card, um, they're held and detained until someone high enough, high up enough is called to where they actually no one exists. So the problems that that causes is just too ridiculous. You might as well just get a visa. Now a visa is very simple. All you really need to do passport, um, passport photos. Um, you go through the registration process. Of course, you have to give them um, health information um, as well as reasons why you're going there and you need somebody in China, corporation, person, whatever, to actually hand in a form as well to, shoot, to prove that this is why you're going. Um, the M visa is a temporary visa. If you're going to China for less than six months, this is the one you want to get. Both of these are commercial visas um, for business. So the M visa is temporary, less than six months. It's normally for most people that use it are normally students and people who are really going in there for not much, just kind of a visit to see what's going on and a very short time. Um, the Z visa is for long term, over six months um, residency. It's for you, your family has to get one as well. But it really is for somebody who's going there to work and trying to improve China. Um, if you do apply for a Z visa or um, any other of the visas that aren't included here, but China does have that aren't commercial, um, you have to apply for residency within 30 days, otherwise they'll kick you out, you know, to say you, that you are going to live there. Um, so import and export. Import and export is um, something that varies greatly because China is so large it, different um, provinces, different places, they pick their own regulations, basically. Um, they pick tax rates, they pick, they basically give on governing control over what comes in and what comes out. Um, the taxes are enforced by the state. They normally um, put between nine and 10%, but it does vary um, because of how large it is. Um, the person who is importing or exporting, because both laws actually are very similar. Um, they have to co-sign and they have to pay for the goods. They have to pay the tariff and the taxes. Um, sorry. Um, according to the General Administration of, com of Customs for the People's Republic of China, you can actually request for them to keep um, all your um, trade secrets, all your company secrets. For example, um, companies like Coca-Cola, um, like KFC, how they have all of their secret ingredients, you can request to keep all of your dealings with them private. Um, there are things that are exempt from duty, things like samples, like commercial samples, which have no market value, um, things as in goods that were lost or have not been, um, that you have not arrived to be exported or imported, and goods that are in transit, things that are there temporarily that will be moved. Um, after 15 days, if you have not paid, you, um, there's a increase as a tax. They increase your payment by 0.05% for each day that passes. Um, so basically, what I've covered here today was the import and export regulations, the environmental regulations, although there aren't many, and the visas that are required to work in China. I'm going to pass up to Pamela, you can close. Okay, thank you. And just to uh, recap a little, I spoke to you today about the GDP and some of the infrastructure changes in China and about its general stability in the global market. And then Jackie spoke to you about the culture, about some places to visit and times to avoid China. And then also uh, Dasha spoke to you about the population and about some of the weather patterns of climate in China. Samantha spoke about, excuse me, about the politics. She gave some information on the uh, China's one child, uh, one China policy. And then Anthony spoke to you about some of the visa regulations, which are really important to know about. And with all that said, I want to thank you all for coming today and listening to our presentation. I hope that it gave you some information. Uh, that will help on deciding whether or not you'll invest 
we as a group do think it is a good idea as long as you're investing in a particular sector that would be uh, profitable for you. So it just takes a little extra research. But thank you for coming, and at this time we can take any questions.